Hello, and thank you for joining us. We're excited to have you with us for this discussion on family intervention. My name is Andre Wade, and I am a program and policy analyst with the National Alliance to End Homelessness. I'm joined by Tanya Price of Youth Services of Tulsa and Dr. Norita Milburn of UCLA Simmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. We'll be taking the questions at the end, so please use your control panel on the screen to submit your questions. My colleague Sam Batko here at the Alliance will be facilitating the Q&A. Also, we'll be posting this webinar and the presentation on the Alliance's website in a few days. In case you weren't aware, June is Family Reunification Month, which is sponsored by the American Bar Association Center on Children and the Law. For today's webinar, I will provide an overview of family intervention, which will include family reunification, family connecting, and family finding, and aftercare services. Tanya will discuss family intervention work being done within a continuum of service options, the challenges and opportunities for family intervention, as well as how to reduce barriers to providing services to families and individuals in need. Norwita will discuss a short family intervention model called Support to Reunite, Involve, and Value Each Other, STRIVE, the components that are included in STRIVE sessions, and how family intervention can be delivered for families of homeless youth. The strategy to intervene with youth as part of a family unit is a promising strategy to prevent and end youth homelessness. As we've learned, many youth leave the home because of family discord and or family crisis. And many of these youth that leave home return home within a week with little or no assistance. To, to facilitate youth returning home and to strengthen family, the family to mitigate any future ejections of the youth from the home, family intervention work needs to be implemented. Family intervention creates a space for families to work on core issues that led to a youth leaving the home while the family is in support is in a supportive environment. Through counseling, meetings, and other formats, families are provided an opportunity to improve their communication skills, decrease the impact of trauma a youth has experienced, identify a circle of social and community supports, and identify other resources that may be needed. These resources may include financial assistance, housing assistance, utility payments, food, mental health or substance abuse counseling, to name a few. Family intervention is a strategic intervention to link unaccompanied runaway and homeless youth, regardless of age, to their family. Family intervention is an umbrella term that can include discrete strategies such as family reunification, family connecting, and family finding. The goal of family intervention can be to return a youth to his or her family, or to connect him or her to a caring adult, or to provide a family with additional resources after youth has exited a program to keep the family intact. Research shows that youth who are connected with family have the potential for improved outcomes and self-sufficiency by decreasing the impact of trauma a youth has experienced. And, and aftercare services can be a form of family intervention that is provided to a youth and their family after a youth has exited a program. The purpose is to provide youth and their family with additional support and resources such as referral to community providers and financial assistance to facilitate a youth self-sufficiency and or to maintain the youth in the home. Family reunification refers to the process of returning children in temporary out-of-home care to their families of origin. The process is delicate and ongoing and often requires follow-up or aftercare services. The needs and strengths of the youth and parents must be assessed individually and as a whole to get to the core of the discord and the goal of reunification. Counseling of the youth the parents and the family as a whole is at the center of family reunification services. During the counseling sessions, the family discusses the issues that led to the youth leaving the home. A formal or, or informal plan is developed with the input of the youth and family to determine when and how the youth will return home and what supports the family can access in case of a future crisis. Overall, the process of family reunification helps the family in rebuilding their relationship. Family reunification should only be conducted with buy-in from the youth and should be youth-directed as much as possible. One must remember that several unsuccessful reunifications may occur before a successful one does. Therefore, ongoing assessments of the youth and family safety and well-being is needed, and sometimes additional counseling and resources as well. Family, connecting, family connections are important even if a youth's parents cannot physically or financially care for them. 
When this is the case, providers ought to ensure that a youth has some sort of relationship with their parents and or extended relatives. When youth have positive relationships with their family, the youth's outcomes can improve. These outcomes include a decrease in pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases and a decrease in risky behavior such as substance abuse. Family connections include a youth and their parents being close in their relationship, a youth feeling loved and wanted, and youth acknowledging the importance of relationships with the family. Family connecting can be facilitated by engaging youth and parents in activities, ongoing and regular phone calls and email exchanges, connections via social media, and the inclusion of family members in milestones such as birthdays, graduations, and other celebrations. When immediate family and supports are seemingly exhausted, family funding is a model that is used in child welfare to identify and engage extended family and fits of kin that are important in the life of a youth. The model which centers around the youth includes six stages, discovering the family member, engaging the family member in the process, planning for moving forward with reunification and or family connecting, decision making as to when and how the youth will reunify and connect with the family member moving forward, evaluating the ongoing well-being and safety of the youth, and follow-up supports to keep the family together and connected. Family findings should be implemented over time when the, when the youth is ready. Introducing family and non-family members into the life of a youth after a long period of absence can be a delicate process that requires thoughtful case planning. Once a family member has been located, then the process of building relationships need to occur. Aftercare services, which can be found in a number of service contexts, such as juvenile justice, child welfare, and homelessness, can be formal or informal, depending upon the objective of the intervention. The common thread between the different types of provisions of services of aftercare is the community-based and sometimes in-home focus of the services that have the goal of providing someone with the necessary skills and support to not re-enter the system from which they exited. This service, these services are viewed as continuous, therefore planning should begin as early as possible. Aftercare services can include counseling, referrals to community programs, financial assistance, and helping a youth and family to access resources independently. There are many benefits for implementing family intervention for runaway and homeless youth, such as ending a homelessness episode, having a housing destination for a youth, improving relationships and strengthening a family, increasing the potential of a youth having positive outcomes, and mitigating future runaway or throwaway episodes. Many of you have witnessed and experienced these benefits for yourselves and therefore can attest to the power of the process when things fall into place. A number of evidence-based family intervention models exist and are implemented in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems. Given that runaway and homeless youth have similar backgrounds and characteristics, as runaway and homeless youth, who are often referred to as non-systems youth when they have not had or currently have any involvement with juvenile justice or child welfare, many of these models are promising and being effective for working with runaway and homeless youth and their families. I encourage you all to explore these family intervention models. Project STRIVE will be specifically presented later during this webinar. And now I'll pass things over to Tanya Price from Youth Services of Tulsa who will discuss family intervention services being done through a continuum of service options. Thank you, Andre. Good afternoon. Like Andre, my name is Tanya Price, and I'm the Director of Outreach at Youth Services in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Youth Services has been around since 1969, and we have 17 programs focused on protecting, educating, and developing youth. The majority of those programs focus on youth 12 through 17 years of age, but we also have several programs and a department focused on transitional age youth 16 to 24 years old. Among the programs at Youth Services, we have a family counseling program, a 20-bed emergency shelter, a transitional living program, a street outreach program, and several support groups. When families are in crisis and are in danger of breaking up or they have recently broken up, they need timely interventions to be able to deal with the crisis and reconnect. Youth Services focuses on reducing barriers to assist families in being able to access services and interventions in a timely manner. The first way that we reduce barriers to families is by having multiple doorways that a family or youth can access services. Like I mentioned, we have a shelter, street outreach program, transitional living program, and 
counseling program that youth or families can come to us through. In addition to those programs, we also have a National Safe Place program where youth can access youth services programs by showing up at any quick trip, fire station, bus, or ambulance and stating that they need a safe place. We also have a strong LGBTQ support group and are involved in all the GSAs in the schools to help youth become familiar with youth services. So youth can come to us through any one of our 17 programs and we offer a full continuum that helps them gain access to the appropriate program and services for their needs. Youth services has, a cri has crisis programs like the shelter and TLP. We have counseling services both office-based and home-based. We have youth development programs like art studios and youth leadership forum. But we also have strong community connections. We have connections with food pantries, employment training programs, educational programs, law enforcement, and groups working on human trafficking issues. We also reduce barriers by having multiple locations. In addition to our main office, we also have five satellite offices in the surrounding communities. The agency uses blended funding and does not rely on Medicaid. This allows us to provide same-week appointments without having to go through a pre-authorization process. We use a sliding scale payment system, but no one has ever denied services if they were unable to pay. The family sessions vary based upon the needs of the family, but typically are around 8 to 10 sessions utilizing a solution-focused approach. Often the families benefit from education on the developmental issues surrounding adolescence. Many families then realize that what they are experiencing is not that different from other families with adolescent children. At times, the adolescent wants to assert their independence like an adult, and other times they're craving their parents' protection and support. Staff assist the family in looking at safe and healthy ways for the youth to take on more responsibility and gain independence. Counselors also help the youth learn to communicate their needs to their parents. And additionally, the counselors explore conflict resolution skills with the family and assist them in practicing these skills within the safety of the counseling session. The commitment uh, to family Keeping families together and reuniting families needs to be an agency-wide value and cannot just be the job of the counseling department. Family reunification also probably should not just be the focus with younger youth still in a family unit, but also with runaway and homeless youth and also with young, the young adult populations. People are not becoming fully independent until their mid to late 20s, so it is our belief that young adults can also benefit from the support of a healthy family. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this slide because this is probably a cycle that you're familiar with if you have worked with youth. But this represents a pattern that we were seeing with the youth we were working with. It starts with the youth craving connection. At this age, many youth are getting a strong sense of identity and need of belonging filled by peers, but still a great portion of that comes from families. We see, the, see that even with our homeless um, and runaway youth that are camping. They often form small groups and camp together. They often kind of form pseudo-families and even identify to each other as brother and sister. We used to see them leave services to go and seek out family to see if things had changed or if what people had told them about their family was true. And they often did this alone and left services because they didn't think that people would agree with their decision. Oftentimes, the reunification would be unsuccessful, maybe because the family didn't have enough support to handle the transition or it happened too quickly or the same issues that led to the breakup still existed. This would at times lead the youth to experiencing feelings of guilt and shame because they couldn't make it work or because they felt they had disappointed people by their decision to seek out family. Those feelings then often led to the youth not returning for services or they would go to a new agency and start the process of building connections all over again. This slide shows the interventions that are used to try and change that cycle. We know and understand that youth crave connections and sense of belonging. So the staff create opportunities for open discussions about those feelings. Kind of like the sex talk, this cannot be a one-time discussion. Staff assist the youth in looking at possibilities for connections. Youth may have conflicting stories about family. We have seen this to directly reflect the conflicting emotions that the youth has inside. We know that youth are probably at some point going to seek out family. And because this happens, the youth needs to be prepared. We ask the youth to be part of the process and how we can stay connected as they go on this journey. At this point, it's not about whether we agree or disagree. It's about letting the youth guide the process. The reunification may still be unsuccessful, or maybe with additional support and services it will be successful. But if not, the youth is still involved in services and has the support system, system to lessen the impact and deal with any feelings of shame. 
They no longer have to worry about staff disappointments because we were by their side during the entire process. This allows services to continue without disruption and the process of developing connections to continue. This next slide focuses on our work with families. We use a strength-based approach with our youth, so it makes sense to utilize a strength-based approach with the families. One way we do this is by showing families respect. We have already established that youth get a strong sense of identity from their family. So by showing the family respect, we are actually also showing the youth respect. This can help the youth to see their family in a new way. We also try and look for opportunities and not just the deficits of a family. We view families as a valuable resource, but oftentimes we need to explore what the family needs in order to become that valuable resource to the youth. Often, a family is in desperate need of support. We provide that by listening and understanding. And sometimes that family has a whole long history with the youth that we may know very little about. Sometimes families need to go through the past so that then they can move on and focus on the present and future opportunities. Staff also work to with families with community support groups like NAMI or PFLAG. We also help by providing education through our counseling department or community groups. We have an equality center just three blocks away from our main agency that does amazing work with families on educating them about LGBTQ issues. Sometimes families are not able to be a resource to their children because they themselves are lacking resources. We actually had a young lady come into the transitional living program who had been living with her mother in a car from the age of 16 to 18. The young lady had been pulled from school in the sixth grade and came to us not wanting anything to do with her mom. But as soon as she moved into her apartment, staff found out that her mother had also moved in. This young lady felt a strong need to take care of and protect her mom. The staff could have asked the young lady to move out for moving her mom into her apartment without permission, but instead they began case management with the mom as well. They were able to help the mom move into supported housing. The young lady went on to complete her GED, complete her degree at a local university, and now works in the transitional living program here at Youth Services. Another focus of our work with families is targeted on finding mechanisms for the family to stay engaged. Many come to us with the belief that it is either all or nothing. Either the youth is living with them and they are providing all the support and services in isolation, or it's nothing and they no longer want to be part of the youth's life. We help the youth and families discover a way for the family to continue to participate in their lives together. Many times the family is able to join the support team of a youth and work on specific tasks like cooking, driving, or searching for employment. And we look for opportunities for home visits, on the weekends or holidays. Another possibility is doing a weekly meal together or meeting once a week for counseling. We have found that it is important to keep some level of connection to be able to build for the future. So let's talk about what makes this work so difficult. As a support person in a young person's life, you can develop strong connections and feel need to protect the youth from any disappointment, rejection, or hurt feelings. But when it is safe, and it's the youth's decision, if we steer them away from that path, we could be denying them with a great opportunity. So once safety has been established, we try and focus on staying youth-driven. Ultimately, it is their life, and they know best what is right for them in their situation. We move to the passenger seat and focus on providing needed support. There really is no one way that we provide family inter intervention and reunification services here. Each plan is individualized to the youth and family based on their strengths and needs. And because of this, it might be helpful if I give you a couple of examples to see how it's done here at Youth Services. We actually had a young lady come into our TLP program at the age of 17, and we'll just call her Lucy. Lucy had been in child welfare's custody since the age of two when her mother's husband abused Lucy. Lucy desperately wanted to reconnect with family. When Lucy turned 18, through the support of her child welfare worker, they found her mom. We invited her mom to attend a team meeting where they were able to meet and slowly get to know each other. Mom was no longer married to the man that abused Lucy and was excited about forming a relationship. They attended counseling together and weekly team meetings. Nine months later, Lucy returned to live with her mom. It's been nearly two years, and with the support of her mom, Lucy has obtained her GED and is attending training school to become a pet groomer. Another example is we had a young man enter services through our street outreach team. He had been kicked out of the house for being gay and had not spoken with his family in over a year. 
He identified that he missed his two brothers and that they were his source of motivation and support, but had no contact because he was not allowed in the home. His reunification, or his family reluctantly agreed to counseling services and attending educational groups at the Equality Center. Now, I wish I could say that the family completely turned around, but I can't. What I can say is that the family invites Dylan over for dinner every week on Sundays where he gets a chance to see and interact with his brothers and that there is still hope that the family will continue to make progress. So even though this is not an example of complete physical reunification, it is an example of emotional reunification and a step closer in the process. The last example is of a young man who is on the autism spectrum and had a very conflicting relationship with his parents. He was taken to the youth shelter by his family when he was 17, and his parents were emotionally done. They were invited to team meetings for him every week, and after about a month, they showed up. The father offered to help him learn how to drive, and his mother agreed to teach him to cook some easy meals to help him prepare for independence. He now makes regular visits into the home, and his family visits him in his new transitional living program apartment. They actually invited him to come stay with them while he recovered from a surgery he had to have to deal with his epilepsy. There are several plans for transition for this young man, but one of those does include going back home until he can finish learning all the skills he needs to be independent. This last slide just gives you my contact information, and I want to thank you very much for allowing me to share some of the work being done at Youth Services. Thank you, Tanya, very much. Next, we're going to have Dr. Narita Milburn, who will discuss the STRIVE model. So thank you, Andre. Um, and also, um, it's very nice to, fall, um, to follow Tanya, because I think there's um, very nice overlap with her work. So good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to participate in this webinar to explain first um, why we decided to develop and implement a brief uh, family-based intervention for homeless adolescents and their parents or guardians, and second, to provide you with an overview of Project STRIVE, which is the Brief Behavioral Family Intervention. So as most of you know, Homeless adolescents are usually characterized as being more at risk for HIV, substance abuse, mental illness, and victimization than adolescents in the general population. So what we try to do in our research here at UCLA is to really try to push back against this negative picture to um, address a very basic question, which is how do we intervene to prevent chronic homelessness among homeless adolescents? So our research has really focused on um, being able to uh, determine who goes home. So what we have done in our work is to um, collect data um, on newly homeless adolescents for uh, over two year periods. And for us, newly homeless adolescents are typically adolescents um, younger than the age of 18, who've usually had uh, no more than one um, episode of, of um, homelessness and maybe have been out of um, home um, two or three nights within um, the last uh, six months or so. And what we do is we define going home or exiting homelessness as living in a familial housing for adolescents who are under 18. Um, and uh, because we do follow adolescents over time, um, some of them um, do become 18 or older during the course of our work. So for those adolescents, um, being stably housed would be in their own apartment. Um, so for us, familial housing includes living with a birth family, a foster family, um, step family, grandparents, or other relatives, or being in a family group or adoptive family home. So what we have found in our research um, that led us to think about developing um, a family-based intervention was we found that about 68% of um, uh, newly homeless adolescents exit homelessness at some point. Um, but we observed that many who exit homelessness, uh, who return home, uh, cycle in and out of home, as many of you know. 
we also found that family bonds were associated with uh, social support, that is, um, either emotional support or um, instrumental support where family might provide a meal or some type of other help for, um, for, for youth. Um, and what was important about this was that these family bonds were, um, were actually supportive and not just um, associated with social and behavioral problems. We also found that family support was important for adolescents um, to uh, stably exit homelessness. So what these findings suggested to us was that a family intervention that could assist parents and adolescents, um, that could provide skills to foster positive family interactions, might be a useful early intervention strategy. So we developed um, and tested a brief five-session cognitive behavioral intervention for newly homeless adolescents and their parent or guardian. And the intervention is called Project Strive. It's a support to reunite, involve, and value each other. I will tell you that we um, have naming contests with our project staff. and um, It's always kind of fun to come up with the name, so it's not something that we generate. We do it with project staff and also with um, service providers, and we usually have a prize. Um, we always have a prize for the person who comes up with the winning name, so that's how we got this name. Um, and what we do in, in this intervention was that we um, really try to not blame the adolescent or the parent or guardian. Um, we um, define running away as being really um, a negative response to unresolved family conflict. So the intervention really focuses on family conflict. Um, we tested this intervention in Southern California, primarily in Los Angeles and Riverside County. So um, the intervention really focuses on family strength, problem solving, conflict negotiation, and role clarification. The intervention, it's only five sessions. The sessions last about an hour to an hour and a half. And the intervention sessions were provided at a site that the family chose, and usually they chose their home to have the um, intervention session. So let me talk a little bit about the key elements of the intervention. Um, and then I'm going to um, show you um, the first intervention session. So the key elements of the intervention include learning how to um, affirm appropriate behaviors via tokens. This is a behavioral intervention, and I'll talk a little bit about how we use tokens in a moment. Um, we also use a feeling thermometer to teach emotional regulation, and we the other core elements are problem solving, role playing, and reframing. So let me tell you a little bit about the feeling thermometer. This is probably something that many of you are familiar with because it's often used in cognitive behavioral um, interventions. So what we do in the first session is we help people think about um, a way to get in touch with and check their feelings. And we use the feeling thermometer to, to do that. So we ask them to um, think about a situation that makes them um, extremely uncomfortable, some interaction that they might have with um, their adolescent or even just something in their daily life that makes them feel extremely uncomfortable. And something that the thing that makes them feel the most uncomfortable, we have them think about it as being one. So kind of high temperature, highly anxious, not feeling good, maybe a little nodding in the stomach, maybe a little sweating, maybe talking a little loud, maybe yelling a bit. Um, so we have them think about something that, that causes them to feel that way. And we have them say what it is. And then we um, do the same thing, but have them think of about a situation that makes them feel um, not at all uncomfortable, something that makes them feel um, very relaxed, where there's no, um, no kind of sweating, no yelling, um, no nodding in their stomach. So you know, if I was going to, if I was doing a session right now, and we were 
talking about the feeling thermometer, I'd say for me, I'm probably at about maybe 60 on my feeling thermometer right now doing this webinar. Kind of, uh, I will say I'm very uncomfortable, but not totally comfortable because speaking to a group is always a little anxiety provoking. And then if I was going to think about something where I'm totally relaxed, not at all uncomfortable, I live in California, so I would say it's probably being on the beach and watching the waves. And so we, we go through that type of exercise in the first session. So let me um, show you the task for uh, the first session for Project Strive. So this looks a little daunting. There's a lot that's popping up on the screen. and You're thinking, oh my gosh, if I was delivering this intervention, how would I get through all these things in an hour? So I just want to let you know that really what's, mo what's basic for this session are um, four things. One, it's to remind the family that love is there. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The second thing is to teach the family how to use tokens for affirmation. We'll talk about that. Then we introduce the feeling thermometer for emotional regulation, and I just shared with you um, what that means. And then we take a picture uh, to create a family album that um, we use to document process, progress over time. And I'll just throw out that the intervention is manualized. So let me talk a little bit about the um, about how we help remind the family that love is there. So for those of you who are parents or who worked with children and work with adolescents, you know that when you've got a baby, small child, it's really easy to think about all those kind of warm, fuzzy things about them. When you are the parent of an adolescent or working with an adolescent, that is much more difficult. So one of the first tasks that we do is to have the family think about the last positive interaction they had with their child or something that occurred that made them feel good about their child. We ask the child to do the same thing for the parent or guardian. So for the parent, it might be the last time you were home, um, you came into the kitchen and you smiled at me or you made eye contact with me. That made me feel good. For the child, it might be something like, um, I told you about something interesting that had happened to me and I felt like you were really listening to me. So it's really just having them remind um, each other that kind of love is there. And it seems a little corny to say that, but it's really important to start the session, this first session, by helping people think positively about one another. And um, then in terms of using tokens for affirmation, um, this is something that um, my staff, my team thought, oh my gosh, we're not going to be able to do this, Norwita. We're not going to be able to use tokens um, in this type of intervention. And I'm a behaviorist, and I said, I think we can use tokens. So here's how the tokens work. Um, the first session, we explain that we're going to be using tokens to just to um, reward people for any positive thing that happens during the session. So the adolescent is given tokens, the parent, guardian is given tokens, the uh, intervention facilitator has tokens. So the first thing that the facilitator does is the facilitator gives each person a token and says, here's a token to just thank you for taking the time to come together to participate in this session. And then the facilitator, as the session begins, if the adolescent makes eye contact with the facilitator, the facilitator will hand the adolescent a token and say, thank you for looking at me. Thank you for listening. So the um, what the facilitator begins to do is model how um, positive um, interactions can be affirmed. And as you know from working with uh, runaway and homeless youth and their, their, their families, these are families where positive affirmations have not occurred. So it's just a way of beginning to teach them how to do it and also um, to, to get the process going and to begin to normalize some of those positive um, interactions. So when I, the 
I've talked about the ceiling thermometer. So the last task for this session is to um, take a picture to create a family album. And the reason that we do this is we take a picture at the beginning, and we take a, the first session, we take a picture um, at the end of the last session. So the first session when we take this picture, usually people are not uh, we we'll tell them that we want to take a picture. We ask them to stand next to each other. They usually don't stand very close to one another. They're us there's usually no body contact. The last session, we say we want to take a final picture. In that final session, usually people are standing next to one another. There may be some body contact, an arm around one another, just standing shoulder to shoulder. So the picture from the pictures from the first and last session are really nice visuals for the family to see how far they've come from the beginning to the end. We also, um, because we're creating a family album at the beginning, what we do, it's not only the picture, but we give them a notebook. And in this um, um, notebook, we they can put in materials that they use for their homework sessions. Um, many of these families have um, problems that we cannot resolve with this brief intervention, so we're often connecting them to resources um, and other types of interventions that they might take advantage of. So that information is also put into the notebook as we go through the sessions. Okay, so that's um, how the first session works. Um, and I've introduced you to um, kind of the major um, um, goals that we try to accomplish in this first session. And there are five sessions. Um, the next two sessions begin to um, address problem solving, um, some of the rule clarification. There's homework. We do, uh, we practice problem solving. We teach them problem solving skills. Um, we teach them uh, reframing skills as well. So what have we found with this? Um, this brief uh, intervention. Well, we have found that it is efficacious for, um, for newly homeless adolescents. With this intervention, we were able to improve mental health. We were also able to reduce um, substance abuse and um, HIV risk behaviors. We were um, less, our, our findings for deterring homelessness are less striking. We found both the um, adolescents and families in the intervention group and those who were in the control group, there wasn't much difference in terms of runaway episodes. We think this is in part because we had to run this as a pretty rigorous uh, study. And so that um, contributed to, I think, the lack of differences uh, between the two groups. Um, but what we think of as much more compelling from our findings is that we were able to reduce um, behaviors that are associated with, um, with, with uh, adolescents leaving home and um, also reduce behaviors that are associated with conflict and that's, that's substance use and um, the conduct problems. So I want to um, say thank you again for allowing me to participate in this webinar. I um, am providing my contact information uh, if you want more uh, details about the intervention. And I think I've left um, lots of time for questions. Yes, you did. Thank you very much, Norita. And thank you to Tanya as well. We are now ready for the Q&A, which is going to uh, be facilitated by my colleague, Sam. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. And I'd just like to remind people that if you have questions, please type them into the chat box on the lower right-hand corner of your dashboard. Um, we have a couple of questions that have already come in, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with those. Uh, the first question is for Tanya. And um, the question is about funding sources. And so specifically, is the counselor that you're having work with the youth and the families, is that paid for through RHYA resources? or um, is that an outside counselor? And if it's funded through outside funds, what are those funds and how are you maintaining the funding for that position? Um, we use a blended funding stream here at Youth Services. So we do have some federal and state contracts, but we also have some private foundation dollars um, and just private donations. United Way is a big support in helping fund our counseling department. OK, great. 
Uh, the second question that we have is for Norwita. And Norwita, the question is specifically about um, the youth that you are working with. Um, would you use the STRIVE model with youth that, say, are autistic or have Asperger's or um, have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, so the very low functioning, like the first percentile? No, no. This is not, I mean, for, for youth who are, for, who, are, who are autistic, this would not be an appropriate intervention. Okay. And, okay. Oh, go right ahead. Say, I was also going to say, I think for, um, we, we do use the intervention for youth who've had substance abuse, a history of substance abuse, but they cannot have current substance abuse problems. Youth who have, um, who, who are, um, who had fetal alcohol syndrome as young people, as, I mean, as children, as babies, and have um, major cognitive impairments, this would not be appropriate for those youth either. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I have a couple of follow-up questions um, to uh, Norwida as well. Um, is there a place right now where people can go to find a more um, full results of your study, um, so more of the um, outcomes that we weren't able to cover today? Absolutely. The, the, um, there's an outcome paper that has been published, and I I was encouraged not to talk about <laughs> research as much in this um, seminar. So I actually, um, it's in a Journal of Adolescent Health, and it was published, I think, April of 2000. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, um, it's 2011. And actually, the best thing to do would be to email me, and I could send you a PDF of the article. I also believe that we can um, send it out to all of today's right. That could be sent email. out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, so the the next question is, um, where is the area, Norita? This is still for you. Where Project Drive is currently being implemented, and what is the training cost that's associated with it? If you, I, I don't know if you really have that information, we, but I, I don't have. We are trying to get this disseminated, and we actually have. Um, probably some interest that we're going to be doing a training in the fall. We're working out the details for that. Um, and we, um, we're open to um, disseminating it and to training people on how to use it. So again, the best thing to do is to contact me. Okay. Great. And then this next question is probably going to require um, a little bit more time, um, but we have about 17 minutes. So, Norita, I want to give you the chance to um, answer it because we've gotten it a couple of different times in different iterations. So you talked a little bit about what the first session um, looks like. Could you expand on what um, the next few sessions look like or what a typical sort of track of um, sessions would look like for um, a family? I can. Can you give me literally like two seconds to just I pull up my notes and then I can mm -hmm. talk about that. Great. So, so I the way that we think of each kind of session has um, a um, title. So the first session that I talked about is really what we call creating a positive family atmosphere. Um, so I highlighted the goals for that session. The next session is what's called, uh, it's called family problem solving. So what we do is we have the families identify and uh, rank problem situations, and then we show them how to relate the feeling thermometer to each problem. And once families have identified um, the problems, we ask them to to prioritize, to identify a family problem that we can begin to work on. And we encourage, we, we really kind of encourage um, and select for a relatively easy family problem. And we um, practice problem solving using that we have a, a structured problem solving model that we use. And we go through that structured problem solving model with them with um, a relatively easy problem. So that happens in the second session. 
Then in the third session, we um, go back to their list of problems, but we pull out a problem that's a, a more that's a little more difficult. And we talk about some of the obstacles, challenges to solving that problem. So we talk about, this is where we begin to focus on roles. So we talk about rules and roles, um, kind of what the assumption, how this family operates assumptions that they make. We talk a little bit about the status quo for the family, kind of what are the benefits of the way things work now, but maybe what are some things that they could actually improve upon. Um, and then we actually um, take that problem of moderate difficulty and we practice problem solving with that. And then the other thing that we do in this session as well at the end is we, uh, because we're, we've been focused on HIV prevention, um, we do talk about um, some of the HIV risk around um, um, substance use. Um, and we also talk a little bit about, kind of remind on particular parents and guardians a little bit about what life's like on the streets when kids are out of home. So that's the third session. Um, in the fourth session, we're back to, again, with problem solving, but we really talk more about, um, the fourth session is called Resolving Family Conflict. And we, um, again, we go back to a, fam a problem now that's more of high difficulty. And um, again, do the problem solving with that. Um, we talk about um, negotiating solutions um, also so that we can come up with solutions that are both um, that are, 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 are workable for both the adolescent and the parent. So here's an example. So we've got, an, um, from one of the families, we're here in, Los, in LA County, um, in some communities that we're in, gang violence is a big issue. So parents want kids in the house um, um, in the late afternoon, early evening. They don't want them hanging out. They don't want them hanging out with friends. So we've had a conflict where um, and one of the kids did not um, follow that and so the kid um, would not come in and back and forth the parents response was to um, cut off their cell phone use their their phone use and make them come in so and that led to a lot of conflict also led to uh, running away episodes because the kid would leave to go hang out with his friends and not come home so what was the kind of negotiated as the solution, and this was between the with the facilitator and the kid and the parent, was the solution was to, um, you know, that the um, kid would still need to come in late afternoon, early evening, couldn't hang out, but that phone contact would not be cut off, so the kid could still remain in contact with his friends via the phone. So it's, you know, it seems like a small issue, but that um, cutting the kid off from all contact with friends was creating um, a lot of stress and uh, in that family. Um, and so that was a way we negotiated um, a, a solution. So that's session four. Um, for the last session, we really, at the last session, we go to the, the problem that, that was um, highest on the families list and we go through the problem solving skills with it. Um, at that session we kind of go back to all the problems and talk through the different solutions that have been um, worked through. We have get the family a chance to really talk about kind of what works, what didn't work. Um, and then we um, really, um, at the end of that session, uh, remind the family that they are their strengths and what they've learned, the skills that they've learned that they can solve problems, that they can solve problems without um, having it escalate to the point where the kid um, is going to run away or leave home. So that's kind of quick overview of what goes on. There are home, there are homework assignments that go along with each of the sessions. Um, to just reinforce what's being learned in the sessions. Um, so that's quickly in a nutshell for each session. And I okay. did not go through the problem solving solution that we need because that just takes a little bit more time to explain. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much, Norway. I hope that that answered the, the couple of questions that we got about the next few steps. And I'm sure as more of your trainings come out and more of that strive comes out and um, gets circulated, people will be able to replicate it more and more. Um, the next question that I have, I actually have two questions are for Tanya. The first is, um, Tanya, can you expand a little bit about the aftercare services that you provide and um, what sort of outcomes you've seen with them and how they've been effective? As far as aftercare, um, it, it depends on the program, you know, but with our transitional living program, we've made a strong commitment to providing aftercare services once they've transitioned into the community or back home. Um, we've seen a lot of young people without aftercare services end up homeless again. So not only are we trying to increase the number of youth that are able to get into safe, stable housing and reunite with family, but we're trying to also help them maintain. So for six months, we're still providing case management services to kind of ongoingly assess, you know, what the needs are of the family, make sure that they know how to connect with the community and that those resources are there to maintain them. So for the first six months, we're still providing active case management in the home um, or with the youth in the community. And then an additional, you know, three months after that six months, we're making regular phone contact with the youth and their family just to see how things are going, make sure, you know, there's no additional assistance that they need, and also to kind of look at our outcomes. Outcomes has been something, you know, that's kind of an area where we're now moving into even stronger, but I would... I think it's been estimated that around 75% of our youth successfully transition into the community. And I would guess that about 25% of those actually reunite with family and, and move back in with their, their parents. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question, and I think, Tanya, this one is probably for you, too, as well, seeing as you're running a transitional living program where, you know, you're housing youth as well, um, simultaneously mm -hmm. as doing um, any family work. Um, how are you dealing with sort of, like, the responsibility or liability that the program would have for youth's behavior? You know, that's something that I think it's in the back of our mind, but we just can't focus on. You know, we have to do what's right for the youth, and, you know, a lot of it is youth learn through natural consequences. So we don't have a whole lot of rules and restrictions in our program. We have expectations, and we work with them on building that relationship that's about respect and trust. And, you know, we hope that they make good decisions, but we know at times that they're going to make mistakes. Um, you know, mistakes surrounding drugs and alcohol, weapons and violence take very seriously, and they know that from the beginning. Um, and then there's other mistakes, you know, like not going to school for a couple days, or, you know, maybe they got fired from a job. That can be a great learning experience for the youth, and we try just to let them experience that and be there to support and kind of talk through those situations. So I would, I mean, some, especially with the 17-year-olds, you know, I would Liability is on our mind, but we just can't focus on it because if we get so stuck in what if they do this and what if they do that, then we make it, you know, about expectations and rules and not about, you know, the youth moving forward into adulthood. They need to, you know, have some room to breathe and really kind of try out some of these skills. So we just try and give them opportunities where there, you know, we do have somebody that's on site in our transitional living program buildings to kind of be our eyes and ears. Um, they're also there in case the youth is experiencing a crisis to help them work through that. And we just go forward from there. Okay, great. Just a reminder to um, participants, we only have about five minutes left, so if you do have questions, please make sure that you send them in now, um, or we probably won't be able to get to them while we're on the call today. Um, our next question is for both Andre and Tanya. Um, and Andre, um, uh, from your perspective, um, the reason that this question is directed towards you is that, you know, you have a, a national perspective, and people are kind of, um, are wondering, um, how does family intervention for older youth work, youth who are over the age of 18? Um, what does that look like? Who are they being reunified with if they can't be reunified with directly with their parents? Um, and then also, Tanya, seeing as you're running a TLP and you probably have youth who are over the age of 18, could you speak to a little bit to how you're managing family reunification or family findings for those older youth as well? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, from um, our perspective, we see family intervention as a viable option for all youth, uh, no matter their age. And just because a youth is an adult legally at the age of 18 doesn't mean that they are really ready to be on their own. Um, and so the field is 
shifting towards um, continuing to provide services to these young folks um, in a positive youth development way. So as youth are older and still need support, we've known that through research that they do better if they're still connected with family. So if youth are already leaving a transitional living program and going home anyway or going back to relatives, then they can help have that facilitated that process facilitated earlier. Um, so they can be um, have a, the option to have their um, family be a resource for them to go home. And if the family isn't an option for that physical reunification, um, then the family should still be able to be connected with the youth so that youth can be supported as they move through their life. Um, and that's so that a youth can be able to talk to someone, to mentor them, um, to, to help them navigate through life. They need that, that secure person. And if it's someone that's already in their life, either a, a parent or a relative or what we call a fifth of kin, uh, one of those family friends um, uh, out in the community, then that's even better than having um, a, a mentor who they don't know kind of build that relationship to move forward. Um, even like in child welfare, you know, we used to assume that just because there weren't immediate family available for that youth, that there weren't any family members available at all, when in fact a lot of extended family members would not even know of the crisis that the family was involved in and wouldn't even know that the child was out of the home, so they were out of the picture. But once you go through the, the eco map and find out um, from the youth who's important in their life um, to be that positive um, person, um, we find through family finding that there are adults out there already that can be supportive for and a person that's over the age of 18. And lastly, with um, someone that's over the age of 18, you don't have to deal with those legal constraints where if you want to place the youth um, outside of their parents' home, you don't need the permission of the parents. You can just go ahead and, and, and do so. Um, and so, you know, as with a minor, you would have to, in most states, uh, get sign off from a parent in order to like place with a, a grandparent or an aunt or something like that. So the, the options are actually greater with older youth as far as placing them in the home with someone that they know and, and um, have a pre-existing relationship with. Tanya? I completely agree with what Andre said. I don't know that I have much to add. Um, you know, research shows that people aren't becoming fully independent to their mid to late 20s. So they're going to need the support of, you know, either family, community, mentors. There has to be somebody, you know, there to, to help provide the youth with some knowledge, them, just somebody to listen to them. So the only thing I think I could add is we try and form a whole team. And so the burden doesn't feel like it's placed with one person. Like, I have to be available to this youth all the time, no matter what. You know, there's there's a team of people around the youth that support them so that, and, and they may have different functions. You know, one may be able to help with employment, while one may be able to help with cooking skills, and one may just be a really good listener for the youth. So everybody, you know, around that youth has kind of functions, and the youth has multiple people that they can reach out to when they're in need. Okay, great. Well, we only have about one minute left, so I'm going to wrap up with just one last question. But before I do that, um, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we had a lot of questions about this. Uh, the PowerPoints and a recording of this webinar will be available on the Alliance's webpage in the coming week. Uh, it, we'll make sure to send it out in our newsletter next Tuesday so that people will be able to find the link to it. You can also visit our homepage at www.endhomelessness.org, um, and it will be posted as soon as possible. Um, and then the last question is, um, is back for Norwida one more time, and we have gotten a lot of questions um, in regards regards to sort of how people can get training on this, and I know that you said that you're just beginning this, but um, a lot of them have focused around is there going to be a curriculum or a training manual that people will be able to buy? Have you started thinking about that, and are you planning that? Okay. I'll say yes to everything, but let me just, we, this is a manualized intervention, so we, we do have, everything is laid out in, in, the, um, in the manual. So we already have a curriculum that's been developed that we can teach people how to use. We are um, really excited about working and having this opportunity to, to do this through the Alliance. We are really, really interested in and um, being able to train people to, to, 
to do this and to getting it out there. And we're also trying to make the training um, affordable because we know who we're working with. And we're so, um, and that's something that we are we're we're in the planning stages now to really think about how to make it accessible and affordable so we can get it out there. Okay, great. And that's all we have for questions today. Andre? All right. Well, thank you all very much, uh, Tanya and Norwita, for participating, and Sam for helping out, and for all of you who attended. Um, again, we will have the information on our website for you to uh, refer to in the future. Thank you very much, and have a great rest of the week.